and you gave it away. Bitch in the street, ain't no regular pay. Out of the pit like you out of the grave. Even the rocks is declaring your praise. Go Ricky Bobby, but I lift my hands to a baby. He rode a donkey, this ain't no Mercedes. I live forever, so you can delay me.
Good morning, Liberty Church. Why don't we stand together and give God some praise? The word of God said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I saw the Lord and he heard me. Amen. And he delivered me from all my affairs. Yes. Come on, let's praise him.
Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Psalm 23 says this, that the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. Some people need refreshing this morning. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And this is the key point here. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we're worshiping, the Lord gave me a word with this psalm, and he says, my goodness is coming after and following everyone all the days of their lives. But sometimes we live in a season where we require his rod and his staff. See, the rod is for direction. The rod is to prod us to go in the right direction, to correct behavior, to correct the walk that we're doing in our lives. And the Lord would say this morning, if you don't feel like goodness and mercy are chasing after you, then maybe you need to repent of something. Maybe you need the rod this morning. Maybe you're walking in that season. But then there's those who require the staff. Maybe you've you've had your head down in depression. Maybe you've had your head down in a season of feeling pity upon yourself, thinking you're not good enough, that God's not calling you to do great things. The relationship is broken. The business has gone bad. Whatever the situation is, God said, lifts your eyes up to me, and my staff will guide you. See, he can walk us through the valleys of the shadow of death. And and out of that valley can come great victory, can come a place where God is preparing you for a new season. And I've learned one thing, that no matter how terrible or how tough your situation might be this morning, God's goodness surely is following you. I want to go back into this chorus. One thing that God asks me every morning 
He says, David, are you grateful? Are you grateful? And I said, Lord, I am grateful. And he says, what are you grateful for? And I start listing big things and extraordinary things and things that God has promised and delivered on. And he says, be grateful for the small and simple things. See, God can work powerfully in the simple things of life. I know it sounds really weird, but yesterday I said, thank you, Lord, for hot water that runs because I've been watching a show from the 1800s and they didn't have that. This morning, if you require the rod, see, the Bible says that God will only correct and discipline those he loves. And if you're anything like me, I have a long laundry list of things that I need to repent for on a daily basis. So take a few minutes in the quiet and repent and say, Lord, I need your rod. Lord, I know I've gone astray. I know I've done some things, Lord God, that maybe I don't deserve your goodness or your mercy, but I repent and lay it down this morning. And if you're in that season that you require his staff, the Lord would say, just look up to me. Stop looking down on your situation. Stop looking at the circumstances around the storm that you might be walking through or the valley that you might be in. Because in that valley, the easiest place to look is up. And his staff is waiting there to guide and direct you. And I just want to be quiet for one or two minutes to give you an opportunity to repent and to look up. And then I want to encourage you as we go back into this chorus. If you have one single thing to be grateful for in your life, sing this song with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Let's make the city of Schenectady stop and say, where is that sound coming from? I hear a sound of gratefulness. I hear a sound of goodness. I hear a sound of mercy. I hear a sound coming from Albany Street. And that sound is the glory and the honor and the presence of our living God. So take a few moments to repent. Take a few moments and look up and let's sing with our hearts the goodness of God. your voices.
Thank you, Jesus. You know, when we look around the world, and even in our own lives, there's so much around us that feels so often like it's out of control. Like it's out of balance. Like oftentimes we feel like we need to walk a tightrope on things. And what every single one of us needs, I don't know everybody, but what I know is this, what we all need is a firm foundation. A firm foundation, something that we can establish the rest of our lives upon, something that we, we can build upon, something that's reliable, something that's resilient, something that props us up when we are struggling in life. We need, we're, we're desperate for a firm foundation. I want to tell you, if no one's told you today, that that can only be found in Jesus, the one who loves you. He loves you. Even if you don't know him personally, I want to say this. He loves you. I know that. We know that. I've experienced his love. I know and I've read in the Gospels where Jesus Christ, the Son, gave his life up for you and for I. And it's on that firm foundation that I know that I can build my life. And I know that you can build your life on that kind of firm foundation. And so, Lord, I pray for every single one in this place where life feels out of control, where, there fe where it feels like there's chaos ensuing. Lord, I ask, I pray, I petition you right now for those people for a firm foundation. A firm foundation it may feel completely different to what they're accustomed to, accustomed to, but Lord, I pray for that firm foundation for each and every one, for every household. For every family, for every marriage, I trust you, Lord, for a firm foundation that we can build our lives upon. Because we know that's why you gave your life, your blood shed and your broken body. And we thank you for the victory that it brought us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, why don't you give our worship team a hand? as well as that incredible tech team at the back. You know, we only, we, know, we, only never, we only ever look at the tech team when something goes wrong. So why don't you look back at them and say thank you for all that they do. So if you're a guest to Liberty Church, well, welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. There are QR codes on the backs of your pews. There are QR code, there's a QR code that will most likely appear on screen very shortly. If you could scan that and then uh, follow the link and fill in your details, we would love to get in touch with you. A number of you have already done that, which I really appreciate. We will be in direct contact with you because we want to do life with you. We want to connect with you. Middle school, uh, you are leaving for your class right now. You're going with Rodney. So let's pray for Rodney. For No, I'm joking. Um, I asked... Uh, I asked someone in church this morning, I asked them where their wife was, and she said that she was down in combat duty, I mean kids ministry, so anyway, but I promise you, our, we have amazing kids volunteers and middle school volunteers, so we are so grateful for what they do. I'm going to hand over to someone else, and that someone else is going to uh, speak to us about giving and also announcements. Thank you, young lady. Good morning, Liberty Church. It's so good to have you all here this morning. My name is Hannah. I serve on the media team here at Liberty Church. So if you ever see a flash in the middle of service, it is not Jesus coming down to get us just yet. It is just me taking a quick picture. Well, today it is my honor and my privilege to talk about giving. So a lot of you, I hope, will know the story in the Bible where Abraham is called to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. In this story, Abraham showed obedience and great faith to the Lord. And that is where we pick up in Genesis 22, verses 11 through 12, where it says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You see, we're never forced to give, but we actually get to give. It's a privilege that we get to do that. 
We get to sow into the church. And when we do that, we demonstrate our fear and awe of God. As the hosts come forward this morning, remember when you give this morning, whether it be through our app, into the buckets, online, mail a check to 1840 Albany Street. Remember, you are not just parting with your money, but you are actually demonstrating the fear of the Lord. And if you weren't here last week, you would know, or you wouldn't know, but we were focusing on the fear of God. So as the hosts come forward this morning, um, I'm going to be walking us through some announcements this morning. So first announcement, May 3rd through to the 4th, Liberty Church is hosting a 24-hour, yes, 24-hour worship event. We would love to have awesome representation from Liberty Church through this event because it is such a big deal and it's going to be awesome. So if you look behind me on the screen, there should have been a QR code that will come up. But imagine the QR code there. If it was there, you would scan it. You would get lots of information on how to register for those different time slots. And secondly, please watch our webpage this week because we're going to be having lots of information going out on that webpage, www.lcny.us. That's www.lcny.us, all about our groups. Now, this year at Liberty Church, our focus is on community and connection. And so we are really focusing on those groups this year. So definitely take a look at that webpage. Um, when that information comes out to see more about that so you can get connected. And that is all I have for you. So I, without further ado, want to welcome my dad back on stage to bring the word. Thanks, Han. Here's my notes. You can preach. Let's have her preach. Truly. Hey, good job. Thanks, Han. Excellent. Are we getting ready for church, Jameson? Good. Yeah. <laughs> so with that said, who is ready for the Word of God this morning? <laughs> well done, Jameson. We'll work on the timing, but well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really do. Firstly, I, um, I need to stand in front of the church this morning and make an apology. Um... and this is the serious part of the apology, <laughs> that for many, many years, a whole host of people have been praying for us for our, our immigration case. And uh, on Friday, we received our permanent residence to these United States. So, so the apology, the apology is that I'm sorry, but you're now stuck with us. So, did you say accepted? Okay. And then uh, that was actually my fault that the QR code didn't come up, and we can chat later. But the, rather than a QR code, you can, if you want to know about the 24-hour worship event, if you want to book a slot for that, go to lcny.info. That's our Next Steps page, and you can book in there. We would love to have you. I just heard amazing things about the last event, so we are certainly in for a treat. So we're in a series that we started last week called The Awe of God. You're more than welcome to go back and watch if you missed out. I want to go straight to the Word of God. I'm reading from the Amplified, Amplified Version right now. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll read that again. For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ. You see, the reality with all of us, and none are exempt, we all have three different images that we portray. You see, you have your perceived image, you have your projected image, and you have your actual image. So what am I talking about? I'm glad you asked. You see, our perceived image is how others see us. I, I, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> As I get to serve in, in church leadership through the years, I am often completely amazed at the different ways in which I am personally 
perceived. I really am. Some of it's bad, and, and, and then occasionally it, it's good. But I have to accept it all because it's other people's perceived image of me and, and what I'm about. But I heard a story recently, and I hope this gets across something about a perceived image. Jameson, who was playing keys, and his wife, Erica, who was on stage as vocalist this morning, their nephew, Ritz, that's his name, Ritz, recently got a butterfly house kit. Now, I've never had one, so I'm going to explain it to you because I didn't know anything about a butterfly house kit. So with a butterfly kit, you get a whole bunch of caterpillars, okay? You get these caterpillars, and so he got his caterpillars, and he decided it was to name them. He wanted to remember them, you know, become his friends, so to speak. He's a little guy. And so he decided to name his caterpillars as follows. First one was Master Splinter, Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello. You see the theme? And then his final one was named Dennis. So I got a text informing me that there Dennis is. He's gone from a caterpillar, and he is now a painted lady butterfly. You see, the thing is, I got this text telling me about this occurrence that he was named Dennis after Pastor Dennis at his uncle's church. So that is the most amazing story I've ever heard about my perceived image. How old is Ritz? To a four-year-old. So if you ever thought you had a problem or difficulty or challenged about your perceived image, I bet you've never been compared or perceived as a painted lady butterfly. That's a boast, let me tell you. But serious question, have you ever given any thought to your perceived image about how people perceive and receive you as a person? Even when it involves your best of intentions, it's worth thinking about, it's worth dwelling on even a little. And then we all have the projected image, that thing that gets projected out, that that we actually foster, that we can care about. Because you know what? I'll tell you about the image that I want to project. I want to project, if I really had to sum it up, I want to project love. Love for Jesus, love for His church, love for my wife and for my kids and my soon-to-be-here granddaughter, love for people, love for the people in the church, love for my friends. I, wanna, I want to project an image where I just love. I also want to project an image where I'm approachable, where I'm teachable. I want to project an image that I'm a hard worker. I want to project the image that... Um, I'm dashingly good looking and healthy and have a six pack. I would love to project that image, but as much as I pull in my stomach and it's painful, especially on a Sunday morning, it's often not possible to project, to project that image accurately. I would also love to, be, love to project that I'm a hilarious comedian. You see, the thing is, what we want to project we can foster and we can spend time on, but really at the end of the day, it's just a projected image because actually what we have at the end of the day is our actual image. That is who you really are. The good, the bad, the light, the dark, it's who you really are. As much as we might try, it's something that cannot be hidden from God. It can't. We can do the right things spiritually and say the right things at the right times to project an image about ourselves, but understand God knows us from top to bottom. He knows everything, every thought, every word, and every single deed, the Word of God says. He knows it all. And this is the thing about our actual image. This is what will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment is for believers of our good and bad things that we've done. So we all have those three images. Perceived, our projected, and our actual image, who we really are. If you think about Jesus for a second, 
He went through a tough time. He was completely misunderstood, falsely accused, identified as a drunkard and as a glutton, labeled as a heretic. Often, even being accused of being demon-possessed. This is Jesus, the Son of God. He was rejected by the religious leaders and obviously many others along with religious leaders. He was lied about. He was accused of things that didn't even come close to who he really was. He was accused of being an unholy man who hung out with sinners and tax collectors. And the list just goes on and on and on, and we see this all throughout the Gospels. His perceived image was completely unfavorable, especially the leaders of the day. Even Jesus' brothers, those very close to him, they were controlled by people's perceptions. They even try to push Jesus into the same kind of prison or bondage, which was the fear of man. In John chapter 7 and verse 34, we read this. They said to him, leave here and go to Judea, Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. Now, doesn't that make sense? It might have helped in the marketing department of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Wouldn't have that helped some of the unfavorable perceptions about who Jesus really was? But Jesus' actual image is quite different than what many people actually perceived. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Christ is the, the visible image of the invisible God. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. You see, what endured all throughout the ages was Jesus' actual image and not His perceived image. He could have succumbed to His perceived image, but it was His actual image that made it through the ages. You see, the amazing thing about Jesus while he would walk the earth was that he completely avoided popularity, notoriety. He didn't go for accolades. Oh, look at me. By the way, did you see what I just did? How amazing was that? He didn't really care for the approval of men at all. He would say truthful but controversial things and seemed like he was leaving people hanging enough so that they had to wrestle with that truth. When people wanted to promote him and make him king, what did he do? He just pulled away. He says, no, I'm not going to have any of that. There was no facade, no illusions about who he was. There was no deceit in him at all, no sin at all. He truly delighted in the fear of the Lord, which kept his focus on the Father. He says, I only do what the Father tells me to do. He shuns self-promotion and any efforts to build his own reputation. Jesus never had to do any self-promotion. Sometimes our projected image, what we put out there, what we foster, what we, what we manufacture very intentionally is for the sole purpose of self-promotion. And then what tends to happen, we can place a lot of our self-worth on that projected image. Here's a principle, though. James James chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord. And it followed by this. And He will lift you up in honor. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. We should live in pursuit of being conformed to the image of Jesus. Not to be consumed with our projected image. And if we're so consumed in it, friends, we will get caught in the trap of letting that, that projected image and people's responses to that projected image, we'll wrap our self-worth 
in that. When our perceived image carries greater weight than our actual image, our priority will then be to protect our reputation. That'll be the priority. That's what we'll fight for. We'll contend for the reputation. We won't be contending for the faith. Our main efforts will focus on how we appear, on our status, on the titles that we may carry, on our popularity or acceptance. It may be around our associations and the big names that we're connected with. I'm not saying, that, I'm not pulling these things out of a vacuum. You and I all know that this actually happens. Because these things we feel cover our own shortcomings or insecurities, and so we place a lot of value on them. None of those things matter at the end of the day. At all. These are not the things that will be revealed or examined at the judgment. It will be our actual image. And this is the scary part. Our actual image that centers around our motives and our intentions. That's scary. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For He will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. So no matter what we say and no matter how we think we perceived and what we try to project, on that day, before the judgment seat of Christ, our private motives will be revealed for what they really are. It's been said that that verse applies to an unbeliever's judgment. Well, that can't be true, because when an unbeliever is judged, they will not receive any praise at their judgment. That judgment right there is specifically for believers. For most of us in this room, this would be the case. Our awareness of this should in and of itself create a holy fear. Because no matter your tone or your body language or what you said your intentions were, there will be that day that the motives, the real and true motives, are actually revealed. It should enable us to live more from our actual image, to be more cognizant of what that is. The opposite is also true. The more we lack the fear of God, the more we're going to rely upon and work on and foster our projected image, what we hope others will see and take away about us. So, with all of that said, we've got to go to the book of Acts. Many of you will know or have read many times the account of Ananias and Sapphira. And for those of you that know, you're thinking to yourself, but why, Pastor? Why do you have to go there this morning? I was having such a good day, but I have to go and speak about Ananias and Sapphira. You might know this story and why it made the pages of story. Of scripture, but there is actually a backstory, and it starts in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, we read Barnabas, who was a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, you need to understand something about owning land and then selling it in Cyprus in this day, in these days. Cyprus 
was an island, and it represented incredible wealth uh, because of, you know, mining and precious metals and precious stones. They had amazing lumber that people would want to source from Cyprus, and it was very well known for things like flowers, which would have helped if you were a butterfly, flowers and fruit and wine and oil. So it meant that if you owned land in Cyprus and you sold land in Cyprus, you were very wealthy. You were incredibly well off. So now I want you to picture this for a moment. A wealthy Levite from Cyprus brings a very large sum of money into the church from the sale of his land. And what he does, uh, you know, in front of everybody, he donates, he gives this money to the church in front of everybody. So that's that's, that's the backstory of the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And I want to just point something out. I'm sure you all know, we can never read chapters in the Bible in isolation. I was just reading from chapter 4, and immediately now we're going to move from chapter 4 into chapter 5. And I'm going to pick it up from verse 1, Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. It starts like this. It says, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. What you should notice, and I'm sure you picked it up because you're very informed people, is the word at the very beginning of that verse, the word but. You see, you've got to understand this very wealthy man, he joins this church, he brings this massive offering, everybody sees it, and what happens is that very offering and what that man did, this man from Cyprus, what it did was create a kind of reaction in the world of Ananias and Sapphira. So what do they do? Well, we pick it up immediately in Acts chapter 5 and verse 2. It says, he brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. You see, so Ananias and Sapphira, the reaction it creates, they take some property, they sell the property, and then consent from his wife, because men, we all know, it's a wise thing to do. Wow, we got one M. Thank you, Lily. Okay. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. He, he gave some of it. He gave some of it, but he kept the rest. Did you see that part there where it says, claiming it was the full amount? Then in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Peter says to him, he says, you have not not lied to men, but to God. Verse 5, this is the kicker. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Bang, dead. We don't like to read this passage in the church of Jesus Christ. We don't like to read this and understand it and accept it about a loving God. But this is Bible. It continues, it says, so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. What caused this kind of response? You see, what happened? If we look at the life of Ananias and Sapphira, to that point they most likely had the reputation in this church, this early church of being generous givers, maybe one of the biggest givers in the church. Did they place a lot of value on that position, on the perception of who they were? Were their insecurities getting to them about being outdone, and so it caused this reaction, okay, like, we'll just sell some property, okay, we'll give some money, okay, we'll, 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 we'll try to match what this guy's doing. You see, it's quite likely that they were living far too heavily in their projected image. So they responded by selling an asset potentially the biggest asset they had, all because of what other people might think of them or not think of them. So much they were living around and fostering this projected image. How easy our projected image can become an idol. If 
for Ananias and Sapphira, appearance was far more important than truth. To such a degree, it led to utter deception. I know this happened over 2,000 years ago, but you and I all know that this is true even in our day. Especially with the rise of social media, we can quite literally get behind a screen and work on our projected image. But you and I all know that that does not necessarily represent who we actually are. We can become so... I'll even use the word obsessed with that, that our actual image tends toward decay, who we really are in Christ Jesus. And if it tends towards decay, it tends towards deception. This couple, you need to know, this couple would have been witness to incredible miracles and signs and wonders. How could they ever think that God would not know and see what they were really about? How could they ever think that they could hide their true motives from God? It happens a lot in Scripture, unfortunately. We read a number of accounts. Ezekiel chapter 9, this phrase, the Lord does not see. We see it in, in the book of Genesis. What did Adam and Eve do after they sinned and disobeyed God? They try to hide from God like he's God. He sees all things, knows all things, and he's all powerful. This is God. We forget this sometimes. I'm, sorry, I know I'm speaking to mostly Christians here, but we forget this. The scripture tells us his ways are higher than our ways. He's outside time and space. When, we, when he sees David, when, when there's this argument about who to anoint king and he wants, um, he wants the prophet to anoint David as king, he's like the, the least of all the brothers. He's just looking after sheep. And there's the statement, well, God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. And we look at that kind of scripture and we're like, amen, isn't that awesome? Until it applies to us. We can't be hiding what we're really about from God. He's God. All these scenarios that I speak about have a common root, and that common root is a lack of the fear of God. We, we get away from right-sizing who God really is. Like we talk about it and songs are written about it and we say amen and praise and all these kinds of things. The one who puts the stars in the sky and makes the planets turn and the, you know, the sun rise and all of the, you know, the waves. We talk about all these things until it applies to our own lives. We need to right size who he really is. Like, you know, he knit us together in my mother's womb. So if he knit you together in, my, in your mother's womb, guess what? He can, also, he, he can also undo the knitting, so to speak. I'm not saying that he will. I'm not saying that he wants to, but he can. We need to right-size who he is. He's not a pal. He's not a buddy. He's not our mate. He is king. John Bevere makes this quote, and I just love how he puts it. He says, our holy fear grows proportionally to our comprehension of God's glory. The antithesis is also true. We will dumb down his greatness, even to the point of human limitations, the less we fear him. The less we fear him, the more emphasis we place on how people see us us. Ananias and Sapphira had fallen into this deadly trap. They were more interested in how they were perceived by others, others that they saw as rivals or friends or church members or leaders or, or people that really counted in the world. That's the perception that counted. If it was a modern day, you know, maybe they'd be this, this upwardly mobile couple in a young church and the church was growing and things were happening. Maybe they had a bit of a reputation that, you know, God was using them powerfully. That's amazing. 
They enjoyed being recognized. Oh, you Ananias and Sapphira, that's awesome. We saw your social media. We saw what you posted on Instagram. That's amazing. I'm paraphrasing, okay? That's amazing. Hashtag yay. I couldn't think of a better hashtag. I'm sorry. They would have spent so much time on their projected image just to enhance their standing. They'd fallen into this trap, but now they were in a habit of just working on their projected image and keeping it strong. It all seemed harmless. It's just, it's just you know, we're, we're trying to keep a good face. We're trying to, you know, a good out, outlook and things like that. Yet what was happening at the same time as they were fostering their projected image is that the fear of God was diminishing. Then the day came when this man named Barnabas brought his offering before the church. The attention of all their peers shifted from them. Now there was another blue-eyed boy, so to speak, in the church. They were outdone. Ah, now what about the projected image? It was threatened. Um, these things don't happen instantaneously. They can happen little by little. We will want to do the right things, say the right things, look the right way, attend the right events at the right times with the right people. And little by little, our awe for God is reduced and diminished. And little by little, before we've realized it, we start walking little by little away from God, because we might see or feel like He is irrelevant. Before we know it, we don't even have relationship with Him. And now for Ananias and Sapphira, their history. It is possible that the Holy Spirit gave us this account included in Scripture to warn us and give, a, give us a glimpse of how serious the judgment seat of Christ really is. God is a loving God. He's a gracious God. But He's a righteous God. And He's a just God. And He will have His way. He will. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 24, worship team, you can join me. This is from the Amplified. It says, the sins of some men are conspicuous, openly evident to all eyes, going before them to the judgment seat and proclaiming their sentence in advance. But the sins of others appear later, following the offender to the bar of judgment and coming into view there. You see, Ananias and Sapphira's sin was made evident to all. It was a very memorable day for them, let's be honest. Their judgment was proclaimed in advance. However, and this should be more alarming to us, is that the sins of most will be made evident later. It's like a future deposit that will mature at some point. But spending time on who we really are in Christ Jesus is what matters, is what counts. What our heart motives are when no one is around to watch and see, that's what matters. That's what counts. That's what's going to be revealed on that day. No matter how amazing your projected, projected image may be, and it, trust me, you're all amazing from what I see. But who you really are is got what's going to be revealed. That's what we work on. That's why we tell you, read the Word of God. That's why we tell you, spend time in prayer. That's why we tell you, Serve the purposes of God. Care for the poor. Not for appearances. It's for your actual image. Who you really are in Christ.
God doesn't only know what I do. He knows the reason I do them. He knows the motives that fuel what I do. Good and bad. Why don't you stand in this place? You know, sometimes, especially when we come to know Jesus, there is a resistance. We have an innate resistance to live as Jesus is calling us to live. And I've heard this said by quite a number of people because it's going to change who I am. Well, hopefully. But I want you to understand something. Jesus calls us to take our sin to the cross, not our personality. That's the essence of your personhood that He gave to you. But your sin is not what He gave to you. Standing here right now, we all have the opportunity, and I'm so glad David brought up repentance. Because we have the opportunity to repent of what we know are just motives that are untoward, motives that do not honor God. You can repent. The word repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change direction, to think another way, to go another way. There's a fourth kind of image, and that's your self-image. That's what you think of you. But I would say this to you. you. What you think of you can be determined by your perceived image, can be determined by your projected image. But again, the only thing that matters is your actual image. What God says about you. What He determined about your life each and every day. Why don't you close your eyes, bow your heads. I just feel for many, and I've been in this place, honestly, I've been in this place. I want to be the popular church leader, preacher, invited to this place and to that. I've wanted to be there. I just don't have the energy to keep up with that projected image. I want to prepare my life for that day where my actual image matters. And I feel for many of us in this room that a lot of the stress in our lives is because of a wholehearted devotion to what's projected to the world. And I believe we'll find freedom if we fully start to adopt and embrace the fear of God and let go, and I really mean let go, of what we try to project to the world. It's not going to matter anyway. Holy Spirit, right now, I ask that you come and flood this place. Help us to let go of an image of ourselves that is not truthful, an image of ourselves that doesn't give you glory. Holy Spirit, make us mindful of those motives that are just not from you, that don't honor you, that don't give you glory. just in the stillness right now I'm not going to call you forward in this moment 
in the stillness right now, you get an opportunity just to say to God, I'm sorry, God. Give me a clean heart. Just repent right now. Those motives, that projection to the world. At Liberty Church, we, we say to people, it's, it's actually okay to not be okay. We don't want to build a church that's full of facade and projection. Jesus loves you, and he loves you, the real you. And we want to love the same you. Holy Spirit, come and minister us in this place. Holy Spirit, help us to let go of that projection, that projected image in Jesus' name. Come on, in this place, we're going to worship. We're going to lift up his name. We're going to thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
If you're in this place, if you're in this place and you are not in a relationship with Jesus, if you've never confessed Him as Lord, said yes and made the decision to start to follow Him all the days of your life, I want to pray for you really quickly. And you can pray along with me, pray something along the lines of what I'm praying or something similar. And just start like this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm here today for a reason. I want to commit my life to you. I'm choosing today to turn around, repent from all that I've done wrong. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sin. 